Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. We carry forward our discussion on the conservation laws and in this lecture, we will have a look at the Forest Rights Act. Now, as against a lot of very old acts, this is a fairly recent act. If you look at the preamble, it says the scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers, recognition of Forest Rights Act 2006. So, what is this act for? It gives, it recognizes the forest rights to the scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers. So, it says Act Number 2 of 2007 because this is when uh, it uh, got finally promulgated. The date is given as 29th of December 2006. An act to recognize and vest the forest rights. So, it is to recognize the forest rights and give the forest rights and occupation in forest land, in forest dwelling, scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers who have been residing in such forests for generations, but whose rights could not be recorded, to provide for a framework for recording the forest rights so vested and the nature of evidence required for such recognition and vesting in respect of forest land. So, it is saying that it is to recognize and vest forest rights and occupation in forest land to whom to the forest dwelling communities especially the forest dwelling scheduled tribes and these other traditional forest dwellers now the important thing here is they should have been residing in such forest for generations but whose rights could not be recorded now why could the rights not be recorded well we have seen before that when we talk about the Indian Forest Act or the Wildlife Protection Act, both of these acts provided for a very stringent procedure for recording of the rights. So, if the government wanted to convert an area into a reserve forest area or the government wanted to create a sanctuary or a national park. So, in all of these situations, it started with a notification of the intention to convert this area into the uh, reserve forest or sanctuary or national park. Now, once this intention was notified, then people were given the opportunity to present before the forest settlement officer or the collector their rights. So, they were given time. The, uh, the notification of uh, intention was uh, translated into vernacular language, local language. It was given wide publicity and in the time that was allotted, these people could go to the FSO or the collector and the FSO or the collector was required to note down the rights. So, we saw before that the particulars of the person as well as the particulars of the property or the rights that had to be noted down, followed by a very thorough process of inquiry of whether or not these rights were actually there. And if somebody was not satisfied, then they could also approach an appellate authority. And only after all the rights had been settled, all the rights had been either taken up by the government by providing compensation or by removing those areas from the, uh, from the intended areas, only after the settlement all of, of all of these could the government notify the areas as a reserve forest, a sanctuary or a national park. So, in theory, it is a very stringent procedure. But in practice, it could have been possible that the people who were residing inside the forest areas, they must have not come to know about these notifications because they were deep inside or they could have not understood them because they were not exposed to the mainline education of those times or they could not have received proper advice about what to do or it could also have been possible that some people would have been afraid to approach the authorities. They were not so comfortable with the authorities, especially the British authorities. 
or in certain cases they were so poor that if you have to go to the authority to put up your papers then you will have to forego your daily wages or it could have been possible that they didn't that they did not have sufficient level of education to put everything in writing so we have seen before that in a large number of these cases it was required that all the applications be given in writing so there could have been instances where the rights were not recognized and this is what the preamble is saying here that these people who have been residing in the forest for generations but whose rights could not be recorded so this act is meant for those people to provide for a framework for recording the forest rights so vested and the nature of evidence required for such recognition and vesting in respect of forest land so this is the objective then it further elaborates on it it says whereas the recognized rights of the forest dwelling scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers include the responsibilities and authority for sustainable use conservation of biodiversity and maintenance of ecological balance and thereby strengthening the conservation regime of the forest while ensuring livelihood and food security of the forest dwelling scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers so what are the kinds of rights people should have the responsibility and authority for sustainable use now we have seen in our country that in certain instances when the uh, contractors went into the forest areas to uh, to chop down the trees then the local population came to protect the forest we have had chipko movement in our country now in the chipko movement people actually did not have the rights at that point of time which they should have had so the community tried to assert its right and here the preamble is saying that this authority for sustainable use it should be a right it should be a recognized right conservation of biodiversity so if the local community thinks that the biodiversity is getting lost then they should have the authority to conserve biodiversity and maintenance of ecological balance because they are the most affected if there is any ecological imbalance so a person who is sitting in the headquarters might not know about the ecological imbalances that are going on but the community that is living in that particular area would be the best possible judge of any of any ec ecological imbalance that is happening and why are these things important to strengthen the conservation regime of the forest while ensuring livelihood and food security so the act uh, premises that if all these rights are given to the people then it will be good for the conservation regime of the forest and it will also be good for the livelihood of the people and for the food security of the people and whereas the forest rights on ancestral lands and their habitat were not adequately recognized in the consolidation of state forests during the colonial period as well as in independent india resulting in historical injustice so this is an injustice that was historical it's not in the current times but historically such some injustice has happened to the forest dwelling scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers who are integral to the very survival and sustainability of the forest ecosystem and whereas it has become necessary to address the long standing insecurity of tenurial and access rights of forest dwelling scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers so now it has become necessary to address these lacuna including those who were forced to relocate their dwelling due to state development interventions so some people were forced to relocate from their areas to make way for state developmental interventions so this act is trying to provide the rights undo the historical injustices in all of these situations be it enacted by parliament in the 57th year of the republic of india as follows now if you look at the arrangement of session of sections as always chapter 1 is preliminary short title extent and commencement section 2 is definitions so we have seen that in most of the acts these two sections are very common then chapter 2 deals with forest rights forest rights of forest dwelling scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers 
chapter 3 deals with recognition, restoration and vesting of forest rights and related matters. What is the difference? If there is a forest right already with the community, then this act is going to recognize that these are genuine forest rights, these are legal forest rights. In certain cases where the forest rights are no longer there, they were earlier with the community but are no longer there with the community, it is going to restore those forest rights, give them back the forest rights. And in certain other cases, it is going to vest the forest rights. So, for instance, there could be certain communities that have never had these forest rights and this act is going to give them these forest rights. So, section 4 deals with recognition of and vesting of forest rights in forest dwelling schedule tribes and other traditional forest dwellers, duties of holders of forest rights. So, every right has a corresponding duty. Then authorities and procedure for vesting of forest rights. So, now we are dealing with the procedural parts. So, who are going to be the authorities to vest forest rights in forest dwelling schedule tribes and other traditional forest dwellers and what is going to be the, the procedure. So, in this chapter, we are going to see the procedural aspects of this act. What is going to be the procedure to give these forest rights or to recognize or restore these forest rights. But then the very next chapter, chapter 5, offenses and penalties is defining offenses and prescribing penalties. So, this is the substantive part of the act. Offenses by members or officers of authorities and committees under this act and cognizance of offenses. Then chapter 6 deals with miscellaneous provisions, members of authorities etc. to be public servants, protection of action taken in good faith, nodal agency, power of central government to issue directions, act not derogation, uh, not in derogation of any other law and power to make rules. So, we begin with chapter 1 preliminary, short title extent and commencement. This act may be called the Scheduled Tribes and Other Traditional Forest Dwellers Recognition of Forest Rights Act 2006. So, this is the legal technical name of the act, Scheduled Tribes and Other Traditional Forest Dwellers Recognition of Forest Rights Act 2006. But in common parlance, we have been calling this act as the Forest Rights Act, FRA. It extends to the whole of India and it shall come into force on such date as the central government may by notification in the official gazette appoint. And so, in view of this subsection, the central government issued a notification, this is the number, this is the date and it said that this act is going to come into force on 31st of December 2007. Section 2 deals with definitions. In this act, unless the context otherwise requires, community forest resource means customary common forest land within the traditional or customary boundaries of the village or seasonal use of landscape in the case of pastoral communities, including reserve forest, protected forest and protected areas such as sanctuaries and national parks to which the community had traditional access. So, when we talk about community forest resource, it includes all of these in areas including the reserve forests and protected forests and protected areas such as sanctuaries and national parks. So, even though the settlement of rights has already been done, but now this act is overruling that and it is saying that if community had traditional access to these areas. So, they will again have access to these areas, they will again have rights into these areas. Critical wildlife habitat means such areas of national parks and sanctuaries where it has been specifically and clearly established case by case on the basis of scientific and objective criteria that such areas are required to be kept as inviolate for the purposes of wildlife conservation as may be determined and notified by the central government in the Ministry of Environment and Forests after open process of consultation by an expert committee, which includes experts from the locality appointed by that government, wherein a representative of the Ministry of Tribal Affairs shall also be included in determining such areas according to the procedural requirements arising from subsections 1 and 2 of section 4. 
so in certain areas that are established as critical wildlife habitats the act makes certain other provisions but then how do you define a critical wildlife habitat it has to be defined by a committee on scientific basis on a case by case basis choosing objective criteria and they must be able to establish that these areas are required to be kept as inviolate for the purposes of wildlife conservation and this critical wildlife habitat it will not just be determined by the wildlife experts it has to be an open process that is done by a uh, consultation including experts from the locality appointed by the government and a representative of the ministry of tribal affairs now why do you need to have the ministry of uh, a representative of the ministry of tribal affairs because this is one provision that might curtail the rights of the scheduled tribes and the otfds and so they must have a voice there which is why you need to have an open consultative process but then the ministry of tribal affairs being the nodal agency its representative should also be there to give voice to the people in case they are not able to express things themselves so the act is taking care that in uh, historical times people were not able to express their rights and so today if we perform the same process it is possible that people might again not be able to express their rights and so the the representative of the ministry of tribal affairs is going to be there to put up their case so this is what this definition is talking about then forest dwelling scheduled tribes means the members or community of the scheduled tribes who primarily reside in and who depend on the forest or forest lands for bona fide livelihood needs and includes the scheduled tribe pastoralist communities so forest dwelling scheduled tribes means the members or community of scheduled tribes so they have to be a member of the scheduled tribes and they must primarily reside in that area so it is not that uh, these people just visit this area once in a while but they are living somewhere else no then they will not be classified under this definition they have to primarily reside in this area and they have to depend on the forest or forest lands for the bona fide livelihood needs so for example if somebody is having an occupation somewhere else then he or she is not dependent on the forest or forest land for bona fide livelihood needs and so those persons will not be included in this definition of forest dwelling scheduled tribes so this is what the definition is saying the person has to be a member or the community of the scheduled tribes who primarily reside in the area and are dependent on the forest or forest lands for the bona fide livelihood needs and this also includes the pastoral communities forest land means land of any description falling within any forest area and includes unclassified forest undemarcated forest existing or deemed forest protected forest reserved forest sanctuaries and national parks so this is an inclusive definition it uses the words includes it's not means so this is an encompassing definition it includes all of these but it can also include certain other forest lands forest rights means the forest rights referred to in section 3 forest villages means the settlements which have been established inside the forest by the forest department of any state government for forestry operations or which were converted into forest villages through the forest reservation process and includes forest settlement villages fixed demand holdings all types of tongya settlements by whatever name called for such villages and includes lands for cultivation and other uses permitted by the government now why do we have all these provisions because in the earlier times to work the forests to extract resources from the forest to cut the trees to carry the trees to drag the trees you required human resources and so what the the britishers did was they settled certain people into certain areas that were known as forest villages so the idea was if you have a forest village inside the forest then those people will uh, act as a supply of labor resource whenever the department needs those and this is what the act is referring to here 
forest villages means the settlements which have been established inside the forest by the forest department of any state government for forestry operations or which were converted into forest villages through the forest reservation process and includes all of these things and by whatever name called and also includes the lands for cultivation and other uses permitted by the government. So, what the governments of those days did was they permitted cultivation on some portions of these forest villages so that the people are occupied year long and whenever uh, they required resources, human resources, they could uh, tap them from these forest villages. Now, Gram Sabha means a village assembly which shall consist of all adult members of a village and in case of states having no panchayats, Padas, Tolas or other traditional village institutions and elected village committees with full and unrestricted participation of women. So, Gram Sabha is a village assembly. Now, it could come through the Panchayati Raj institutions or it could come from the traditional village institutions and elected village committees. So, all of these are classified as or defined as Gram Sabha here. Habitat includes the area comprising the customary habitat and such other habitats in reserved forests and protected forests of primitive tribal groups. We call them PTDGs and pre-agricultural com communities and other forest dwelling scheduled tribes. Now, in this case, the habitat word is not referring to wildlife habitat. It is referring to the habitats in reserved forests and protected forest areas of primitive tribal groups and pre-agricultural communities and other forest dwelling scheduled tribes. So, that is what the word habitat means throughout this act. Minor forest produce includes all non-timber forest produce of plant origin including bamboo, brushwood, stumps, cane, tussar, cocoons, honey, wax, lac, tendu, kendu leaves, medicinal plants and herbs, roots, tubers and the like. So, here again it is an inclusive definition and it includes all non-timber forest produce of plant origin including all of these. Nodal agency means the nodal agency specified in section 11. Notification means a notification published in the official gazette. Prescribed means prescribed by rules made under this act. Scheduled areas means scheduled areas referred to in clause 1 of article 244 of the constitution. Sustainable use shall have the same meaning as assigned to it in clause O of section 2 of the Biological Diversity Act 2002. So, in all of these cases, you have to refer to these other documents to understand the meaning. Now, why is it written in these words? Because if those documents are changed, if the definitions there are changed, then those definitions automatically start applying here as well. You do not have to amend this act again and again. Then, other traditional forest dweller means any member or community who has for at least three generations prior to the 13th day of December 2005 primarily resided in and who depend on the forest or forest lands for bona fide livelihood needs. So, what is OTFD? It means any member and here it says means, it is not includes. So, OTFD means any member or community which has for at least three generations and generation is defined here in the explanation that generation means a period comprising of 25 years. So, it means that they should have been residing in the forest area, primarily resided in the forest area for 75 years prior to this date 13th of December 2005 and who depend on the forest or forest land for bona fide livelihood needs. So, they need to depend on the forest and forest lands for their bona fide livelihood needs. It is not that they are having occupation somewhere else and they will be classified here, no. Then village means a village referred to in clause B of section 4 of the provisions of Panchayat extension to Scheduled Areas Act 1996. So, this is the PESA Act or any area referred to as a village in any state law relating to Panchayats other than Scheduled Areas forest villages, old habitation or settlement and unsurveyed villages whether notified as a village or not or in the case of states where there are no panchayats, the traditional village by whatever name called. 
एंड वाइल्ड एनिमल मीन्स एनी स्पीशीज ऑफ एनिमल स्पेसिफाइड इन शेड्यूल्स वन टू फोर ऑफ द वाइल्ड लाइफ प्रोटेक्शन एक्ट नाइनटीन सेवेंटी टू एंड फाउंड वाइल्ड इन नेचर सो दिस इज बेसिकली द सेम डेफिनेशन एज इन द वाइल्ड लाइफ प्रोटेक्शन एक्ट नाउ चैप्टर टू डील्स विथ फॉरेस्ट राइट्स नाउ फॉरेस्ट राइट्स ऑफ फॉरेस्ट डेलिंग शेड्यूल ट्राइब्स एंड अदर ट्रेडिशनल फॉरेस्ट डेलर्स फॉर द पर्पजेज ऑफ दिस एक्ट द फॉलोइंग राइट्स विच सिक्योर इंडिविजुअल और कम्युनिटी टेन्योर और बूथ सो दे आर गिविंग इंडिविजुअल राइट्स ओवर लैंड एंड दीज आर टेन्यूरियल राइट्स और कम्युनिटी टेन्यूरियल राइट्स और बूथ शैल बी द फॉरेस्ट राइट्स ऑफ फॉरेस्ट डेलिंग शेड्यूल ट्राइब्स एंड अदर ट्रेडिशनल फॉरेस्ट डेलर्स on all forest lands namely right to hold and live in the forest land so they have a right to hold the forest land and live in that so they have proprietary rights and they have the rights of residence so they cannot be removed from that area under the individual or common occupation for habitation or for self cultivation for livelihood by a member or members of a forest dwelling scheduled tribe and other traditional forest dwellers Community rights such as nistar by whatever name called, including those used in erstwhile princely states, zamindari or such intermediary regimes. So these are community rights, and nistar means that rights such as rights to the fallen uh, uh, branches in the forest area that can be used for fuel wood. Right of ownership, access to collect, use, and dispose of minor forest produce which has been traditionally collected within or outside for village boundaries so they have the right of ownership so this these minor forest produce will be owned by the uh, communities or the persons with these rights they have access to collect so they cannot be stopped from collecting them they can use them and they can dispose them of other community rights of uses or entitlements such as fish and other products of water bodies grazing both settled and transhumant and traditional seasonal resource access of nomadic and pastoralist communities rights including community tenure of habitat and habitation for primitive tribal groups and pre agricultural communities rights in or over disputed lands under any nomenclature in any state where claims are disputed so they are even given rights in and over disputed lands rights for conversion of pattas or leases or grants issued by any local authority or any state government on forest lands to titles so the pattas can be converted into titles rights of settlement and conversion of all forest villages old habitation unsurveyed villages and other villages in forests whether recorded notified or not into revenue villages so all of these forest villages and other villages in the forest areas they can be converted into revenue villages now this conversion is at times necessary because once the villages become revenue villages then the schemes of the revenue department also start to flow in right to protect regenerate or conserve or manage any community forest resource which they have been traditionally protecting and conserving for sustainable use rights which are recognized under any state law or laws of any autonomous district council or autonomous regional council or which are accepted as rights of tribals under any traditional or customary law of the concerned tribes of any state right of access to biodiversity and community right to intellectual property and traditional knowledge related to biodiversity and cultural diversity any other traditional right customarily enjoyed by the forest dwelling scheduled tribes or other traditional forest dwellers as the case may be which are not mentioned in clauses a to k but excluding the traditional right of hunting or trapping or extracting a part of the body of any species of wild animal so apart from listing all the rights it, this uh, subsection l says that any other traditional right which was customarily enjoyed by the forest dwelling scheduled tribes or other traditional forest dwellers that is also a forest right except the traditional right of hunting or trapping or extracting a part of the body of any species of wild animal so hunting is not given as a right but other than that all other traditional rights are also forest rights under this act and right to in situ rehabilitation in situ means on the site 
so people have the right to get rehabilitated on the site including alternative land in cases where the scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers have been illegally evicted or displaced from forest land of any description without receiving their legal entitlement to rehabilitation prior to the 13th day of December 2005. So if they have been illegally evicted or displaced, then they have the right to come back and get rehabilitated on the same land or an alternative land if they so demand. Then it continues, notwithstanding anything contained in the Forest Conservation Act 1980, the central government shall provide, now shall provide means must provide, it has to provide for diversion of forest land for the following facilities managed by the government which involve felling of trees not exceeding 75 trees per hectare. So it is saying that notwithstanding anything that is written in the FCA, the central government has to provide for diversion. So the forests have to be diverted for these uses. But only in cases where the felling of trees does not exceed 75 trees per hectare. And what are these uses? Schools, dispensary or hospital, Anganwadi, fair price shop, electric and telecommunication lines, tanks and other minor water bodies, drinking water supply and pi water pipelines, water or rainwater harvesting structures, minor irrigation canals, non-conventional sources of energy, skill upgradation of vocational training centers, roads and community centers. So for all of these cases, the central government has to permit the diversion of forests if it does not involve uh, the felling of more than 75 trees per hectare. Provided that such diversion of forest land shall be allowed only if the forest land to be diverted for the purposes mentioned in this subsection is less than 1 hectare in each case. What do you mean by in each case? It means that if there has been one diversion of one hectare, then there, is, there can also be a diversion of one hectare for another purpose right, right next to it. And then another diversion of one hectare right next to it. So there can be contiguous diversions and a big area can be diverted. But the act says that in each case, the area should be less than one hectare. That's the only requirement and the clearance of such developmental projects shall be subject to the condition that the same is recommended by the Gram Sabha. So if the Gram Sabha recommends and these are the, uh, uh, the uh, objectives and the felling of trees required is less than 75 trees per hectare and in each case the uh, diversion is less than 1 hectare, then the central government has to permit the diversion. This is what this is saying. So these are the forest rights. Then chapter 3 deals with recognition, restoration and vesting of forest rights and related matters. So what will be the process for that? Recognition of and vesting of forest rights in forest dwelling scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers. Notwithstanding anything contained in any other law for the time being in force and subject to the provisions of this act, the central government hereby recognizes and vests forest rights in the forest dwelling scheduled tribes in states or areas in states where they are declared as scheduled tribes in respect of all the forest rights mentioned in section 3. So section 3 listed the forest rights and this section is vesting these forest rights, is giving these forest rights. So the central government is recognizing and vesting these forest rights as I mentioned in section 3 to these people, the forest dwelling scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers in respect of all forest rights mentioned in section 3. Now the forest rights recognized under this act in critical wildlife habitats of national parks and sanctuaries may subsequently be modified or resettled, provided that no forest rights holders shall be resettled or have their rights in any manner affected for the purposes of creating inviolate areas for wildlife conservation except in case all the following conditions are satisfied. So it is saying that in the critical wildlife habitats of national parks and sanctuaries, the forest rights that are recognized, they may be subsequently modified or resettled, but only when all of these processes have been done. 
So, if the government insists that in the critical wildlife habitat, uh, these rights should not be given or they should be modified, then it can do so, but only after all these processes are over. The process of recognition and vesting of rights as specified in section 6 is complete in all areas under consideration. So, first of all, before making any modification or resettlement, you have to complete all the provisions of section 6 of recognizing and vesting the forest rights. It has been established by the concerned agencies of the state government in exercise of their powers under the Wildlife Protection Act that activities or impact of the presence of holders of rights upon wild animals is sufficient to cause irreversible damage and threaten the existence of said species and their habitat. So, it has to be established that uh, people and wild animals cannot live together in the, these areas. The state government has concluded that other reasonable options such as coexistence are not available. Only then it can modify or resettle. A resettlement or alternatives package has been prepared and communicated that provides a secure livelihood for the affected individuals and communities and fulfills the requirements of such affected individuals and communities given in the relevant laws and the policy of the central government. So, there has to be a resettlement or alternatives package. So, if uh, these rights are resettled or if these rights are modified, what are people going to get in return? That has to be prepared and communicated to these people. The free informed consent of the Gram Sabhas in the areas concerned to the proposed resettlement and to the package has been obtained in writing. So, there has to be an informed consent of the Gram Sabha in writing that they are agreeing to this proposed resettlement and to the package. No resettlement shall take place until facilities and land allocation at the resettlement location are complete as per the promised package. So, you first have to develop the resettlement location and only then people can be resettled. Provided that the critical wildlife habitats from which rights holders are thus relocated for the purposes of wildlife conservation shall not be subsequently diverted by the state government or central government or any other entity for other uses. So, once you have resettled them, you cannot resettle them again. The recognition and vesting of forest rights under this act to the forest dwelling schedule tribes and to other traditional forest dwellers in relation to any state or union territory in respect of forest land and their habitat shall be subject to the condition that such scheduled tribes or tribal communities or other traditional forest dwellers had occupied the forest land before the 13th day of December 2005. So, this is the cutoff date and they must have occupied the forest land before this date. Only then this recognition will kick in. A right conferred by subsection 1 shall be heritable. So, it moves with generations, but is not alienable or transferable. So, it cannot be removed, it cannot be transferred to anybody else other than by uh, heredity and shall be registered jointly in the name of both the spouses in case of married persons and in the name of the single head in the case of a household headed by a single person and in the absence of a direct heir, the heritable right shall pass on to the next of kin. So, this is to ensure that these rights are not purchased by third party people and then removed from uh, these scheduled rights and other traditional forest dwellers. So, these are only hereditary rights, they move in the family. Save as otherwise provided, no member of a forest dwelling scheduled tribe or other traditional forest dweller shall be evicted or removed from forest land under his occupation till the recognition and verification procedure is complete. So, till the time this recognition and verification procedure is complete, there is a ban on eviction and removal of people who are in occupation of these lands. Where the forest rights recognized and vested by subsection 1 are in respect of lands mentioned in clause A of subsection 1 of section 3, such land shall be under the occupation of an individual or family or community on the date of commencement of this act and shall be restricted to the area under actual occupation and shall in no case exceed an area of 4 hectares. So, there is an upper limit of 4 hectares or the area under actual occupation whichever is less. The forest rights shall be conferred free of all encumbrances and procedural requirements. 
including clearance under the Forest Conservation Act 1980, requirement of paying the net present value and compensatory afforestation for diversion of forest land except as those specified in this act. So, the rights given on land are free of all encumbrances. You cannot ask those people to pay the net present value or compensatory afforestation or anything else except those things that are mentioned in this act. And the forest rights recognized and vested under this act shall include the land, the right of land to forest dwelling scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers who can establish that they were displaced from their dwelling and cultivation without land compensation due to state development interventions and where the land has not been used for the purpose for which it was acquired within five day, uh, within five years of the said acquisition. So, it also includes the right of getting back to the land which was taken up for state developmental interventions but has not been used within five years of this acquisition. So, if that happens then the people can move back to that area. Then section 5 deals with duties of forest rights, uh, duties of holders of forest rights. The holders of any forest right, Gram Sabha and village level institutions in areas where they are holders of any forest right under this act are empowered to. Now, here comes a lacuna in the act. It starts with duties, but then it says are empowered to. So, these are whether these are duties or whether these are just empowerments and not duties, it is unclear. But then they are empowered to protect the wildlife, forest and biodiversity, ensure that adjoining catchment areas, water sources and other ecological sensitive areas are adequately protected, ensure that the habitat of forest dwelling scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers is preserved from any form of destructive practices affecting their cultural and natural heritage and ensure that the decisions taken in the Gram Sabha to regulate access to community forest resources and stop any activity which adversely affects the wild animals, forests and biodiversity are complied with. So, the reading of this section says that or it appears from this reading that these are more in terms of empowerment. Maybe the first clause is uh, can be considered a duty to protect the wildlife, forest and biodiversity, but the other ones are more like empowerments and less like duties. So, this is a bit of ambiguity in this act. Now, chapter 4 deals with authorities and procedures for vesting of forest rights. So, what is the procedure to give the forest rights? Authorities to vest forest rights in forest dwelling scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers and procedure thereof. So, the process is initiated by the Gram Sabha. The Gram Sabha shall be the authority to initiate the process for determining the nature and extent of individual or community forest rights or both that may be given to the forest dwelling scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers within the local limits of its jurisdiction under this act by receiving claims. So, people will give their claims to the Gram Sabha and the Gram Sabha will receive those claims, consolidate them and verify them and preparing a map delineating the area of each recommended claim in such manner as may be prescribed for exercise of such rights and the Gram Sabha shall then pass a resolution to that effect and thereafter forward a copy of the same to the subdivisional level committee. So, the first step is to be taken by the Gram Sabha. Any person aggrieved by the resolution of the Gram Sabha may prefer a petition to the subdivisional level committee constituted under subsection 3 of the subdivision level uh, and the subdivision level committee shall consider and dispose of such petition provided that every such petition shall be preferred within 60 days from the date of passing of resolution by the Gram Sabha and provided further that no such petition shall be disposed of against the aggrieved person unless he has been given a reasonable opportunity to present his case. So, here again we are seeing the premise of audi alterum partum the person has to be given a reasonable opportunity to present his case. Then the state government shall constitute a subdivisional level committee to examine the resolution passed by the Gram Sabha and prepare the record of forest rights and forward it through the subdivisional officer to the district level committee for a final decision. So, the final decision is taken by the district level committee. 
Then here again, any person aggrieved by the decision of the subdivision level committee may prefer a petition to the district level committee within 60 days from the date of decision of the subdivision level committee and the district level committee shall consider and dispose of such petition provided that no petition shall be preferred directly before the district level committee against the resolution of the Gram Sabha unless the same has been preferred before and considered by the subdivision level committee. Provided further that no for such petition shall be disposed of against the aggrieved person unless he has been given a reasonable opportunity to present his case. Then the state government shall constitute a district level committee to consider and finally approve the record of forest rights prepared by the subdivision level committee. The decision of the district level committee on the record of forest rights shall be final and binding and the state government shall constitute a state level monitoring committee to monitor the process of recognition and vesting of forest rights and to submit to the nodal agency such returns and reports as may be called for by that agency. So there are four levels here. You have the Gram Sabha followed by the sub divisional level committee, followed by the district level committee, followed by a state level committee. Now the application moves from the Gram Sabha to the sub divisional committee to the district committee and the decision of the district committee is final and binding. And the state level committee is only has a monitoring role. So it's not going to adjudicate the disputes, but it's going to monitor and it is going to to submit to the nodal agency as specified later such returns and reports as may be called for. So that is the role of the state level committee. Now the subdivision level committee, the district level committee and the state level monitoring committee shall consist of officers of the departments of revenue, forest and tribal affairs of the state government and three members of the Panchayati Raj institutions at the appropriate level appointed by the respective Panchayati Raj institutions of whom two shall be the scheduled tribe members and at least one shall be a woman as may be prescribed. So you have representations from different departments and also from the Panchayati Raj institutions. The composition and functions of the subdivisional level committee, the district level committee and the state level monitoring committee and the procedure to be followed by them in the discharge of their functions shall be such as may be prescribed. Then chapter 5 deals with offences and penalties. Offences by members or officers of authorities and committees under this act. So who can do an offence here? The offence can be done by a member or officer of any of the authorities or committees under this act. Where any authority or committee or officer or member of such authority or committee contravenes any provision of this act or any rule made there under concerning recognition of forest rights, it or they shall be deemed to be guilty of an offence under this act and shall be liable to be proceeded against and punished with fine which may extend to 1000 rupees. So the punishment is that of a fine which may extend to 1000 rupees. Provided that nothing contained in this subsection shall render any member of the authority or, com or committee or head of the department or any person referred to in this section liable to any punishment if he proves that the offence was committed without his knowledge or that he had exercised all due diligence to prevent the commission of such offence. So it has defined the offence, it has prescribed the penalty and it has also put in this caveat that it was, if it was done without the knowledge or after taking all precautions then the person will not be held responsible. And then cognizance of offences, no court shall take cognizance of any offence under section 7 unless any, any forest dwelling scheduled tribe in case of a dispute relating to a resolution of a Gram Sabha or the Gram Sabha through a resolution against any higher authority gives a notice of not less than 60 days to the state level monitoring committee. So the state level monitoring committee is also going to receive notices and the state level monitoring committee has not proceeded against such authority. So first of all, the option is given to the state level monitoring committee to proceed against the authority and only if the state level monitoring committee does not proceed against the authority on receiving the application, then only the person can go to the court. Then chapter 6 deals with miscellaneous provisions, members of authorities, etc. to be public servants and we have seen this clause again and again. So 
in most of the acts the members of authorities are made public servants under the ipc and here as well it says every member of the authorities referred to in chapter 4 and every other officer exercising any of the powers conferred by or under this act shall be deemed to be a public servant within the meaning of section 21 of the ipc then protection of action taken in good faith no suit prosecution or other legal proceeding shall lie against any officer or employee of the central government or the state government for anything which is in good faith done or intended to be done by or under this act so this is an indemnity clause that if the officer or employee of the central government or the state government has been doing things under good faith then no suit prosecution or other legal proceedings will be uh, taken against them no suit or other legal proceeding shall lie against the central government or the state government or any of its officers or other employees for any damage caused or likely to be caused by anything which is in good faith done or intended to be done under this act so they are also not liable for any damages that have been caused or are likely to be caused no suit or other legal proceeding shall lie against any authority referred to in chapter 4 including its chairperson members member secretary officers and other employees for anything which is in good faith done or intended to be done under this act and then section 11 talks about the nodal agency the ministry of the central government dealing with tribal affairs or any officer or authority authorized by the central government in this behalf shall be the nodal agency for the implementation of the provisions of this act now why does the nodal agency become important because the nodal agency and its representatives have to be there in several of these committees such as the expert committee that is delineating the critical wildlife habitats plus the nodal agency can also ask all the state level monitoring committees to submit reports in certain prescribed formats regarding the implementation of this act so how good is the implementation of this act going on in that particular state that can be asked by the nodal agency now who is the nodal agency it is the ministry of tribal affairs currently so it is the ministry of the central government dealing with tribal affairs which currently is the ministry of tribal affairs or mota but any officer or authority can also be authorized by the central government in this behalf so it is not necessary that the ministry of tribal affairs should be the nodal agency any officer or any authority can be authorized by the central government and made into a nodal agency so it is a power of the central government then the central government also has power to issue directions in the performance of its duties and exercise of its powers by or under this act every authority referred to in chapter 4 shall be subject to such general or special directions as the central government may from time to time given writing so the central government can issue directions they can be general directions or special directions and all the officers and all the authorities that are under this act are going to follow those directions then act not in derogation of any other law save as otherwise provided in this act and the provision of the panchayat extension to schedule areas act 1996 the provisions of this act shall be in addition to and not in derogation of the provisions of any other law for the time being in force so what this section is saying is that other than the as provided in this act and in the pesa act the provisions of this act are in addition to the provisions of other laws so it means that the other laws are not getting changed these are just some additions to be made to the other laws it's not changing the other laws it is not in derogation of of any other law but it is only going to add to what the other laws have been doing so meaning that if the government wants to create a, a reserve forest today the procedures will be the same as are given in the indian forest act those procedures are not going to get changed if the government is trying to make a sanctuary or a national park 
then the procedures are the same as are given in the Wildlife Protection Act. It is not changing those, but the provisions of this act are in addition to the provisions of those acts. Then power to make rules, the central government may by notification and subject to the condition of previous publication make rules for carrying out the provisions of this act. So, the central government can make uh, rules and these rules have to be notified and they are subject to the condition of previous publication. So, they have to be published. In particular and without prejudice to the generality of the foregoing powers, such rules may provide for all or any of the following matters. So, now this is explaining what uh, these rules can comprise of, but they can also comprise of other things. So, things that the central government can make rules on are procedural details for implementation of the procedure specified in section 6. So, section 6 already talks about the procedure, but if the central government wants to make certain details, it can specify those in rules. The procedure for receiving claims, consolidating and verifying them and preparing a map delineating the area of each recommended claim for exercise of forest rights under subsection 1 of section 6 and the manner of preferring a petition to the subdivisional committee under subsection 2 of that section. So, all these procedures can be further detailed by the central government. The level of officers of the departments of revenue, forest and tribal affairs of the state government to be appointed as members of the subdivisional level committee, the district level committee and the state level monitoring committee under subsection 8 of section 6. So, this again can be specified by the central government by making a rule. The composition and functions of the subdivisional level committee, the district level committee and the state level monitoring committee and the procedure to be followed by them in the discharge of their functions under subsection 9 of section 6. Any other matter which is required to be or may be prescribed. So, the central government can make rules on all of these matters, but then this list is not exhausted. The central government can also make other rules. The only requirement is that these rules have to be published and notified. And uh, in a large number of cases, they deal with the procedural details. Now, every rule made by the central government under this act shall be laid as soon as may be after it is made before each house of parliament while it is in session for a total period of 30 days, which may be comprised in one session or in two or more successive sessions. And if before the expiry of the session, immediately following the session or the successive sessions aforesaid, both houses agree in making any modification in the rule or both houses agree that the rule should not be made, the rule shall thereafter have effect only in such modified form or be of no effect as the case may be. So, however, that any such modification or annulment shall be without prejudice to the validity of anything previously done under that rule. Meaning that the final authority will be the parliament, any rules that are made have to be laid, laid before the parliament for a fixed period and the parliament can say that no, you should not be making these rules and then those rules will not be uh, applicable from that day onwards or the parliament can say that no, you need to make these changes to the rules and then those changes have to be made. So, the Forest Rights Act is trying to undo the historical injustices. It is trying to recognize the rights of the scheduled tribes and the other traditional forest dwellers. It is trying to give them certain rights. So, that is the process of vesting of the rights and it deals with all different kinds of procedures that need to be followed to do these. So, that is all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind.